Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome back to my channel. Um, you may notice I have a slight lisp today, I've got a slight kind of tongue thing. So if I sound a little bit different from usual, it's not that I've, I've just decided to get an unfortunate piercing. But that's just where I am at the moment. Anyway, so, um, today I wanted to talk about graphic novels, partly uh, because despite kind of giving myself somewhat of a uh, ban from buying more books because I keep on buying more that I, you know, I've kind of got quite a lot out from the library and also a lot of others that need to be finished. Um, but despite all that, I had a birthday gift voucher and so I decided to buy uh, The Secret to, the, to Superhuman Strength by Alison Bechdel. Now, I loved um, Alison Bechdel's other work, um, particularly Fun Home. Um, I really, I really want to check out some of her other um, ones. I've read Are You My Mother, which I loved. Um, but for me, um, Fun Home is just such a genius piece of writing. It's so dark and sad and funny and warm and so, so many other things. And uh, Secret to Super Superhuman Strength is Alison Bechdel talking a lot about her uh, kind of journey, as it were, with exercise and fitness um, and how kind of a big part of that is this idea of growing strong and what strength really means and all of those sorts of things. So really, really excited to check it out. But when I was looking at it, it then got me thinking about so many other graphic novels that I really strongly enjoy. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about those today. Um, sorry, I'm still a little bit a little bit of a sore throat, so I will occasionally be a little bit slow with my words. Um, so, Alison Bechdel is just such an absolute legend of this, and it's quite hard to know where to almost follow that with. But I thought I'd go through a few kind of classics that I've adored, um, including a few that I'm really keen to check out. So firstly, uh, there is uh, Palestine by Joe Sacco. Now, this book I read a few years ago, and I don't seem to have my copy anymore. I think I must have given it away to a charity shop or something. And that is, uh, Joe Sacco is kind of quite known for, so he used to be sort of some kind of investigative journalist in some form. And so he's made quite a few, he's written quite a few um, graphic novels that talk a lot about uh, his experiences and kind of various places in the world. So Palestine uh, being one, and it's a really beautiful um, evocation of the place and of, of the people's um, struggles there. It's important to note as part of that as well that, I mean, he, there's this really interesting passage towards the end where um, some of the Palestinians around him say, OK, it's all well and good that you're saying, I'm going to share your story with the world, but we've been sharing our story with the world for years and nothing's really changed, um, as we've seen with recent events. And it's really interesting just because I think that really hit me that I, there I was reading this book being like, OK, I think I'm understanding, you know, I'm getting a bit more of an insight into sort of what the experience is like for Palestinian people um, and then realising that yeah the same these same conversations have been happening for years the same in some ways um, I was listening to a podcast the other day and it was really interesting talking about women's rights in the 70s and a lot of the things that women were arguing for and it's interesting I think it was a, an interview with Olivia Lang actually which is the other book I bought actually um, in the bookshop today um, but Olivia Lang was talking about how um, you know, they were hoping that a lot of the discussions would have moved on since the 70s. And it's interesting she was uh, that they were saying that, you know, quotes by Andrea Dworkin in the 70s still have relevance now. And so I think Joe Sacco's Palestine is really interesting for that. Um, there's at one point a whole page that is just um, a war scene, like a double page spread that's just a war scene. And sometimes there are whole, whole spreads with very few words. Um, Joe Sacco also uh, did a graphic novel on Pyongyang um, in North Korea. Uh, which is also quite chilling in that sense because uh, I think something that's quite interesting with a graphic novel as opposed to a sort of written novel is you can play with what words and images look like on the page. So um, in Pyongyang, the colour is stripped from so, so much of the um, of the book. Um, and so you've got these whole double page spreads that are almost entirely black and white um, or are removed, have, have their colour removed in some other way. Um, and the one for Palestine is kind of similar, but then there are some other colours that weave through. Um, really interesting. Um, and such an interesting way to, to tackle some really big issues because you can kind of show and tell a little bit at the same time. 
Um, so both really interesting ones to potentially check out if that sounds like something that would be interesting to you. Um, and on a similar note, one that I have absolutely ad adored um, is Persepolis. Um, so I actually watched the film first. I'm not sure how much of a sin that is. <laughs> um, the film is incredible. Uh, but Persepolis is the story of this young um, young girl, kind of then young woman, um, in her life in um, in Iran, and then sort of moving uh, sort of to, to Europe in some parts. Um, so I uh, this sounds really pretentious. My version is in German, uh, but that's partly because I was using graphic novels as a way to try and learn um, languages because I kind of figured that uh, you've got a few more clues to, to help you out if you're really struggling. Uh, but Persepolis is just incredible. Um, there's something about the art style, I'm not sure how much you can sort of see there, but there's something so stark about it. It's all black and white. Um, and you sometimes have these really beautiful moments because uh, it's done so, so cleverly that there are whole scenes where intentionally things are left um, really open. Actually, yeah, so for example, it seems like this, where you've got, you know, sort of soldiers here and kind of uh, bombs being dropped and things like that. And there's something you can only... You can do so much better with a graphic novel sometimes. Um, I just thought it was beautiful. It's such an, a stunning book, um, talking about her own sort of challenges, and it's such a critical and interesting time that the author, uh, Mariana Satrapi, is, is in Iran and then is in Europe, because it's the sort of 60s, 70s, 80s, and so she sort of sees Iran having its revolution, but then also goes to the, uh, I think she, yeah, goes to Germany um, in a time where Germany is having a really liberalised moment uh, where, you know, she hangs out with loads of sort of goths and rockers. Um, some of her friends are gay and this is sort of mind blowing in some ways for her uh, because she's been used to quite, she's been used to pushing against rules in Iran, uh, particularly around sort of the headscarf and what women are allowed to do in a way that her sort of subversion, um, you know, when she goes to Germany, she is sort of shocked by how um, essentially square she seems compared to them. Whereas in Iran, you know, she's seen as quite a, uh, a game changer. And there's this really beautiful, heartbreaking moment, really, sort of towards the end where she kind of comes back towards Iran and uh, sort of suddenly realises how much she doesn't really feel like she fits in anymore because she's been away and you know she didn't really feel like she fit in before but now she comes back and it's even even more and you've got th beautiful things like this where you've got pages where the art style is just stunning it's all kind of black and white sometimes with very very few um words or, or at all used um and i just thought this was just one of the most stunning things i've read the film is definitely also worth checking out i adored the film which is all also i should say in this style so the whole film is done it's sort of graphic novel black and white these kind of towering figures um, and there's something so great about the way she uses perspective and um, and angles in this that I just think is just such a game changer and just so so beautiful. Another absolute favourite of mine um, is Mouse by Art Spiegelman um, and this is just absolutely stunning in so 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 many ways. Um, essentially it is uh, the story, so this, this sort of Art Spiegelman is talking to his dad about his experiences, um, you know, them as a Jewish family uh, their experiences of um, of the Holocaust, uh, which is obviously not easy subject matter in the slightest. Um, and it's done so, so beautifully. I think partly because there is this really beautiful family element that kind of ties a lot together as well, where, you know, he's sort of trying to find out things from his father. There are so many things that his father will never say. Um, there's also that kind of moment, because I think they're in the US, where, you know, his father sort of always wants to have had a brand new life um, and sometimes doesn't really want to look back and dwell on any of this. But, you know, both of them sort of realise that there's a real need to learn more about it and, and find out what's happening. Um, and uh, so, you know, most of them, most of the characters that we meet are Polish Jews um, and sort of from around, um, from the, around the area. And obviously with concentration camps around that area, I mean, that... <laughs> you know, it was an area that was very heavily hit. And what I think is so brilliant about this book, in so, so many ways, is it's firstly quite unsparing, but actually what, what it does that's really clever, I think, is by making the characters, um, you know, in this uh, animals of some sort. So the, the, the Jewish uh, people in this book are all mice and uh, Nazis are cats. And so you sort of see how that's being sort of played out 
Um, and there's also a great moment where I think there's a Swedish person we meet at some point who is a who is like this glorious elk <laughs> and it's so brilliant because you've had all these characters for so long and then you're like oh here's a giant elk <laughs> um and i think the british are dogs in this i if i remember correctly um anyway but i mean beautiful and very very difficult but i mean it's very very tightly done on the page and which we can see there's there's so much going on um again i read this in german and um what's also really interesting is occasionally i was like i don't really know this german word and then realized it was yiddish <laughs> and i was like that is why i don't recognize this word perhaps and also because my german is not good enough so there's lots i, I missed as well um oh yeah and i've just accidentally kind of hit on it here as well. Uh, there's this moment where Art Spiegelman has sort of drawn himself, I'm not sure if you can see really there that clearly, and it is him with a human face and then a mouse mask and that is so interesting because he's sort of, there's this whole idea of, you know, he feels almost like he's kind of both telling the story but he's also obviously part of it in the sense that it's his family history but he is, he almost feels like he can't uh, there's almost this kind of difficulty in kind of accept not accepting that's the wrong word, wrong word seeing how he fits in within this because he almost feels this guilt that you know sort of survivor's guilt that he he wasn't there he sort of had it relatively easy compared to everybody else um anyway it's such a beautiful beautiful book i mean really troubling really difficult uh, but it goes into it really tracks so much of those relationships in terms of people who sort of spoke to each other before the war and kind of kept in touch, people who passed away or were killed, um, people who um, sort of betrayed other people to kind of make sure that they survived. Um, also what's really interesting is because everybody's painted as uh, their characters, um, you know, they're kind of mice or cats or, or whatever else, and I think there are some pigs. Um, What's really interesting is that, um, as a result, maybe the, no, maybe the Nazis were pigs in this. I'm trying to remember how this goes. I think they were. Um, and maybe non-Jewish people were cats in this. Um, but yeah, you've got this really interesting sense of, of all of these characters going through, going through this time being in a concentration camp and just these horrendous scenes. We see sort of every moment, this kind of real desire to try and survive, but also, you know, we kind of have these little moments of flicking back to Art Spiegelman talking to his father and really trying to understand everything that's happening. And it is just heartbreaking and beautiful and really, really powerful. And I very, very highly recommend this. I really urge you to check it out. Um, I have to admit, I remember a friend of mine doing his dissertation on Mouse um, at uni, and I'd only see the front, seen the front cover and knew nothing about it. And I was like, ooh, is my friend a Nazi? <laughs> because I saw this front cover and I was like, ooh. Uh, and then, then realised what it was actually about. So, um, rest assured. <laughs> um, although not maybe the easiest thing to, to read while you're on, you know, public transport. It might get, get a few weird looks. Anyway. Brilliant, brilliant book. Um, a few others that I really wanted to go into here um, are just some books that I have found really interesting. This next one I think probably counts as more of a kind of comic book rather than a graphic novel, although that line is always really blurred, I'm not kind of sure, um, and that is uh, The Pride, which is um, someone I, I actually know the author, uh, Joe Glass, um, who is brilliant, uh, but essentially he uh, created this sort of set of queer superheroes and uh, it's really it's really fascinating. It's kind of very, you know, very heavily uh, sort of influenced and kind of uh, by kind of other superhero um, films and, and comics um, and it really plays on a lot of those tropes, but it's also really funny because make, by making everybody super queer um, it really allows you to explore various things and also it's such a powerful thing of, you know, the people doing the saving are queer people and uh, often they are also looking after and saving other queer people uh, and there's something so powerful about it and it's just such beautiful art design i mean it's it's wonderful and in your face in terms of how it plays around with um with queerness so there is somebody who is a bear um as in kind of the gay the gay sort of type of a bear but it actually is actually a bear <laughs> and sort of transforms into it and so you can um sort of see him a bit here there we go uh but it's also great it, it kind of plays with a lot of those sort of stereotypes as well so i think actually in that same one you can see uh there are characters who are the sort of velma from scooby-doo kind of lesbian <laughs> kind of trope um there's a kind of uh ripped muscly uh gay guy in in pink 
uh, you know, very kind of tight pink spandex uh, as a sort of Superman kind of figure. Uh, so it's really fun how it plays with that um, and kind of re-owns it. Uh, and it kind of, kind of takes ownership of that again. Um, and really, it's just kind of brilliant um, because it's sort of, it, it feels like the kind of superhero stories that we never really get as queer people. Um, uh, and I just think that's so, so brilliant. It also, um, it reminds me, talking of sort of queer superheroes um, in some ways, um, it reminds me a bit of uh, two two books that I've absolutely adored, uh, which I've mentioned a few times on this channel, but Kryptonite Kid by Joseph Torchia, which has this sort of um, young kid writing letters to Superman, and there's kind of a homoerotic subtext or kind of queer subtext in some form. And then there's also um, A Cavalier in Clay by Michael Chabon. Uh, which also looks at this idea of, of of sort of queer people creating superheroes to help rescue them from situations where they need um, saving. Um, and I think something like Pride really plays on that idea, kind of in the same way that um, when you think about X-Men, which I love, I love X-Men, I need to go back and watch a lot more of it um, and read a lot more of it. Um, but X-Men plays along around with this idea of, you know, people being different and outcast but choosing not to take, you know, this whole idea of if you could have the cure, would you? Um, and that, that's used a lot in X-Men um, and particularly Rogue. This is where I go into a bit, in a bit of detail here, but a character like Rogue uh, really plays with that. Um, and, you know, in the same way that a lot of queer people have that idea of if I could take a pill and make it all go away, would I? And what's really interesting in something like Pride is just that how much there's ownership of that, of kind of queer characters being like, no, 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 so we're superheroes. <laughs> um, and that's just so brilliant. So yeah, I absolutely love it and would really, really highly recommend the Pride. Um, also a quick shout out to a book um, that I adore in its normal version, but is also really fun to see in a, uh, in a graphic novel version, which is The Handmaid's Tale, which was made into a graphic novel. And it's just such a fun way of looking at it. Uh, it's a very kind of, it's an art style that I don't always get a, uh, get on with, which is kind of this sort of like blurry, watercolory kind of look. I don't always love it, um, but I mean, as a, as a collection, it is just so brilliant at bringing to life so many of these scenes. Like I always forget with Handmaid's Tale, every time I've reread it or kind of seen the story about it again, I always forget about those scenes, the scene kind of, maybe towards the end, where, the, it's mild spoiler, where they go to that quite kind of club that is um, just outside of, of Gilead or kind of just in the outskirts, where these rules are really relaxed and sort of, you know, you've got women in lingerie and you've got men being a lot more relaxed in this sort of um, environment. I always forget about that scene and this, this brings it to life really, really vividly as well. So really, really uh, great thing here. <laughs> this next one is a bit of a monster, so it's more of a table book, so you can see just how big this is. Uh, and this is Comic Book Tattoo, which is a selection of um, interpretations of Tori Amos songs um, in graphic novel version or kind of comic uh, book version, hence the name. And Comic Book Tattoo is the name of a, um, is a lyric from The Flying Dutchman by Tori Amos. Um, I love Tori Amos and so was definitely all about getting this um, and it is just I mean it's a, it's a, a, a hunk of a book uh, and it's but it's brilliant um, it's interesting because essentially they were all kind of not necessarily crowdfunded but it was sort of fans of Tori Amos um, who submitted their their um, interpretations of her songs um, in kind of comic book version and so some of them are direct um, like for like kind of uh, interpretations where someone sort of followed the lyrics um, pretty much to the letter and kind of drawn panels to kind of match those um, and then some of them to, uh, they've kind of taken it as a prompt to kind of think of something different so either taking the title and running with it or um, uh, taking inspiration from one lyric and then kind of going off and doing their own thing. And it's really fun as well as a fan of Tori Amos uh, because um, all of the lyrics are kind of at the you can't really see it there properly, but all of the lyrics that are at the beginning of each bit. So you can kind of go back through and check and be like, oh yeah, that does kind of match up. Um, but it's so interesting because it's such a range of style. So you've got kind of like very kind of 
cutesy kind of cartoony stuff you've got more kind of like you know this blue uh sort of almost biro drawn kind of thing you've got black and white you've got this very like watercolory kind of things and black and white and yeah it's it's brilliant it's really really interesting um and it, it, it just does such a, an interesting job of taking lyrics and interpreting them and i just think it's such a cool idea to kind of run a, run away with something like that and do it um yeah so i really enjoyed that and uh, two final ones on the end here are ones I've not read, but I really, really want to. Um, and one of them is Sabrina, which was um, long listed for the Booker Prize in 2018. You, were, <laughs> I can't go a video without mentioning the Booker Prize. Uh, but it was a really interesting thing uh, because it was the first time that a graphic novel had made it onto um, the long list and there are lots of conversations about it and whether it should even have been eligible um, and whether it should have even whether it would make the shortlist and it, it, it didn't make the shortlist I've not read it yet and I really want to but part of me wonders if it also didn't make the shortlist to avoid some of that controversy <laughs> uh, but it sounds so interesting this kind of idea of following a character through um, uh, through their kind of life and uh, this kind of mysterious dis uh, disappearance of, of someone I believe and kind of watching things through camera footage really really fascinating um, and uh, yeah I mean it's super interesting um, especially I've been reading a few others uh, sort of recently I think I spoke about it in another video but um, two that I have really enjoyed recently um, have been uh, Sexuality a Graphic Guide which was a real look at sexuality over history and kind of particularly bringing in bits of theory um, to kind of look at what sexuality really is and kind of debunk some of those bits but all done as a graphic novel which I just thought was so successful and so interesting uh, particularly the, the area on consent was so cleverly done at uh, kind of challenging perceptions and really going into depth in a way that didn't feel preachy um, but also really got to the heart of it and didn't kind of just give a vague thing about what consent is so I thought that was really, really great Another one I've read recently was uh, The Middle Ages, a graphic novel, which, as the name suggests, is a bit of a potted history of the Middle Ages um, as a graphic novel. Um, and I knew very, very little about the Middle Ages, and it was a really interesting way of debunking some of the myths about what the Middle Ages actually are, or were rather and um, the kind of things that happened during it, because, you know, it's often referred to as this sort of dark period where there was no real growth or intelligence or whatever, which is not only wrong, but also quite a Western view because there were vast sort of leaps in science and maths and other things happening in other parts of the world. Um, but it's such a funnily done way. It's so beautiful and funny and warm uh, because it just plays around with these ideas. It's very silly. It feels a little bit like... Um, oh gosh, I can't think of the name at all, but like those like horrible histories. Um, kind of which uh, to people outside of the UK might mean nothing. <laughs> Horrible Histories was sort of a children's TV series and set of books uh, that basically spoke about history in a really fun and silly way. So you'd have, for example, uh, the vile Victorians. It's always alliterative. And um, it would kind of go through historical historical things that are real, but kind of bring it, make it really kind of quite silly and quite camp, really, um, sort of talking about um, a lot of the things that kids would be like, ah, that's disgusting. So, you know, about like sewer systems and how people stored the dead um, in, you know, in Egypt, for example. A fun extra example, and I don't, this probably doesn't count as a graphic novel uh, to some degree. It's more of a kind of reference or sort of picture book for humour. Um, but this is Men to Avoid in Art and Life, which is not only a great title anyway, um, but it's such a fantastic little book uh, by Nicole Tersigny. And uh, this essentially takes classical pictures, um, uh, paintings, and kind of puts uh, captions with them that kind of seem to fit. So often full of uh, men sort of mansplaining um, or kind of some really funny comments. So I'm going to try and find a really good one here. Uh, here we go, yeah. So this one here, I'm not sure if you can see, uh, uh, this kind of uh, sort of man and this woman looking a little bit bored, um, and the man saying, and that is my long and unsolicited opinion on the thing that is your area of expertise. And it's just, it's brilliant. And um, I think, I want to say it was the website The Toast um, did a fantastic set of these before, which was, you know, for example, 
had titles like 23 women who just want to sit and read in classical art or um you know 12 women who are just tired of your nonsense <laughs> you know? things like that and i love it because it's so silly i mean it's not a graphic novel but i really wanted to mention it because it's just such a fun little edition um and occasionally i just sort of flick through it and get some joy um from it all so yeah that's a really fun little addition to this and finally, um, another graphic novel that I really want to check out that I got recently for my birthday um, is Couch Fiction, um, which is a graphic tale of psychotherapy. So it's really kind of looking through um, therapy um, and sort of trying to demystify it, talk a little bit about what it looks like and kind of um, think about what some of those conversations are from the perspective of a therapist to kind of get people thinking about what it actually looks like and kind of get uh, start that process off. Um, so super interesting. Um, I'm really excited to check it out. The, the art style looks really quite interesting. It's quite cartoony, um, but with quite a lot of sort of explanatory text so that it's not... So it's kind of like, although the, the subject matter is tricky, but there are expl explanatory... Expl that word. There are notes to explain <laughs> and there are other bits um, to kind of balance out that kind of darkness or that kind of heaviness um, and in some ways the style of this reminds me a lot of another graphic novel that I really enjoyed which was called I've now completed it's The Mental Load um, I think of, again I think I've given away my version of this The Mental Load um, is just such an interesting uh, graphic novel so it the main kind of part because there are a couple of other smaller bits uh, but the main and, and they kind of address really interesting things as well sort of such as um, racism in France and kind of a few other things around race and gender uh, but the main part mental load um, is um, I think she herself coined the term actually um, I, may, I may be wrong there but I think she did and so the idea of the mental load is that you know presuming that you know essentially you know there's there's a, an imbalance in kind of expectations around uh, gender roles, particularly when it comes to things like cleaning and tidying and sort of household management. And, you know, traditionally that was sort of partly because for a while when men were the only ones who were allowed to work, um, it, that obviously meant that while they were out, the, you know, the home sort of fell under the role of women. Um, and obviously things have changed, thankfully, as well, which is really good. Um, but uh, what this book looks at is that even when um there's sort of parity it's still so much seen as the woman's job that it's seen as people deferring to women to manage uh the tasks that are given out so for example um even if that is oh we need to buy a birthday present for this person um or you know these things need to go in the wash or you know for our child um we need to contact the school about this we need to do these all of these kind of admin tasks even you know tidying up but also you know buying things remembering to change the filter in something you know all of those things and now there are so so many tasks that go into the upkeep of a home and of a social life and of, and of whatever but so so often uh it, this this book says in heterosexual couples that falls on uh the man that's uh, on the woman and um, as a result, even when there's kind of roughly a 50-50 in tasks, women still have to manage those tasks. And so in this book, The Mental Load, it talks about the mental load being this idea that even when there's parity in the tasks being done, because women are kind of roughly tasked with managing those jobs, it still makes it feel like it's the role of the woman. So uh, she gives the example of a boyfriend and girlfriend, I think of her own boyfriend with her, but um, or no, a friend, a friend's relationship and how, um, you know, the this friend, the, the girlfriend in this situation will be the one who at two in the morning will think, ah, right, um, I've got to remember to do this or we'll see something on the floor and we'll pick it up and put it in the the, the washing machine. Small tasks, but that really add up. So and the idea that when the boyfriend is asked to go and do a certain task, they might, this boyfriend does it, but then doesn't do other things along the way. So sees something on the floor and doesn't pick it up or doesn't um, wash something after it's been used, for example. And therefore, by all of those tasks, the, the kind of management of that falling on women, there's a kind of burnout thing associated because women are spending so much time and effort and energy uh, directing people to do the tasks that need to be done 
uh, despite the fact that both people live in that house. Um, and so it's really interesting. I thought this was, the graphic novel was such a great way to express this, um, because I think you can go into a lot more detail about what it physically looks like, but you can also kind of really zoom in on what it looks like to be that woman in that situation, sort of isolated and frustrated and tired and burnt out. Um, and so it's such an interesting book and I really urge you to check it out as well. Again, I think I did give my copy away. Um, but yeah, there are so, so many amazing graphic novels out there. All of those aside, I'd love to hear um, your thoughts if you've read any of these and have really enjoyed them or maybe had less of a good time with any of them. Um, I'd also really love to get any more recommendations for others. Um, I don't know that many graphic novels at all. There are a few kind of famous examples that have been turned into films as well. Um, uh, like and things like the Sandman series uh, with by, by Neil Gaiman um, but I'm really keen to hear from you about any other examples because I really want to check this out this is a an area of my reading that isn't that developed I haven't really spent that much time within this genre and I really want to uh, so yeah any recommend recommendations would be very much appreciated um, I've been Bob uh, and thank you so so much for uh, for watching um, take care and enjoy your reading bye bye